Thank you. I love applauding you back. That's fun. I'm Robert McBride of All Classical FM here in Portland, though if you're a, a, a frequent listener, you may wonder if I've hopped off to another planet or something. I was on vacation for a week, and then I picked up a cold at the end of that, and uh, so it's been pretty much horizontal the past week. But I can talk again, so here I am. And I'm happy to be here with the music director of the Oregon Symphony, Carlos Calmar. Good afternoon. Hey. I apologize in advance for uh, the fact that we are late. It's my fault. I, I had a rehearsal until 12 o'clock, and then I went, I went home and did something. You are forgiven, maestro. OK. It's good to have you here. Fine. And um, I'm happy to say I'm very much looking forward to all three pieces on this program. I love the Beethoven Violin Concerto. I just love that piece. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is the sweetest little tender, simple, nostalgic thing by Aaron Copland that we don't get to hear very often in which the orchestra will be playing for the first time. And then the incredibly dramatic and fun and tense and interesting Symphony Number no. 4 by Carl Nielsen. Uh, as, and as a former, as a recovering percussionist, um, I love Nielsen's music. There's always something interesting. And in this one, we have a battle between two timpanists. So that'll be fun to watch. Actually, this is the very, f oh, probably the only time in history where, uh, if you look at the stage, you will see uh, the setup for three sets of timpanists. Uh, because uh, the the Nielsen piece calls for two sets, complete sets of uh, of drums, which are set on the side, and the the set in the middle is because we have such a wonderful principal timpanist in our orchestra, Jonathan Greeny, and he likes to play classical music on the smaller drums. It's a different sound, and uh, so he brought his own. So now you have a room full of timpani. On an old Academy of Ancient Music recording, in the liner notes, it talks about the difference in sound between the older, smaller timpani and the newer, bigger, modern timpani. Uh, and it says, um, more lightning, less thunder with the smaller drums. And I thought that was a perfect way of describing it. And since that concerto begins with the timpani playing four notes, uh, what, what a nice sound that will be. And you're right, Jonathan's a wonderful player. He's fun to watch, too. Oh, yeah, and uh, he gets a workout. I mean, he has been looking forward to this program because Beethoven Concerto is important for the timpanist because although it's only five notes at the beginning and here and there other five notes, it's still an important thing. You have to make a very specific sound with it. And, uh, and of course, Nielsen for <laughs> Every timpanist I know uh, looks at me and says, when are we going to do Nielsen 4 again? You'll, you'll hear it. <laughs> this is going to be a beautiful, interesting, fun, and exciting concert. Beethoven, Brahms, Tchaikovsky each wrote one big violin concerto. And they're all in the key of D major. Uh, no accident, I'm sure. Now, you're a violinist. Tell us why D major is so great for violin concertos. Well, I... I am not such a, I never was uh, such a great violinist, so I would say, say every composer who does not go into flat keys is welcome, as far as I'm concerned. Um, every composer who doesn't go past three sharps <laughs> is welcome too. So whatever happens in between is fine. Uh, but I think the, the reason is it just the brilliance of sound increases with, uh, with I mean, you have no sharps when you play C major. Then G major is a little... The thing is, the sound of the violin when you write a piece in D or in A major gets brighter. And uh, I think that b all three composers who wrote so magnificently for the violin just thought about that. And you have some open strings, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can do a lot of things that you... I mean, if you... Uh, compose a, a, a concerto in F sharp minor, uh, everybody will hate you anyway for that. Uh, and it doesn't work, it works well. There are great concertos over there. But, but essentially, I was there to say that the best concertos there are for the violin are all written in what I would call normal keys. Yeah. The three big Mozarts, G major, D major, A major, yeah. Beethoven. 
Tchaikovsky, Brahms, we already know, and then there are a couple of others. Barber is in G, Prokofiev is in D major, or in G minor. So it's all, it, there is nothing like A flat minor. I don't even know how many flats A flat minor <laughs> has. Never mind. If <laughs> Mahler had written a violin yeah, concerto, yeah, he, he would have done would, that. Yeah. Uh, the Beethoven concerto, let, let me go out on a limb here, I would, I would guess. Uh, in those three that I mentioned, the Brahms might be the hardest in terms of stamina, the Tchaikovsky the hardest in terms of fireworks, flashy technical stuff, and maybe the Beethoven the hardest just in terms of pure musical expression? Correct. Yeah. Actually, hey, I got one right. <laughs> Actually... Uh, Ah, now he hedges. No, 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 the act comes from... I was from just about to put on that gold star. No, no, you have the gold star, no, qu no kidding. Look, I would say that in terms of violin play, I look at, at this from the perspective of the conductor, of course, not only violinist. I must say I adore Tchaikovsky's violin concerto, really adore it, and I had the tremendous pleasure of doing it, for example, with Hilary Hahn, and... She kind of can play. I think bring her yeah. back. Bring her we are back. We're working on that. <laughs> but what I wanted to say so that everybody can shoot me here in the room is I just think that the Brahms and the Beethoven are better than the Tchaikovsky. So you can shoot me now. Um, the thing is... We wait till after the concert. What do you mean better? Why? Oh, God. I knew that I shouldn't say it. Why, why do we, we uh, people who grew up in Middle Europe, ger meaning German-speaking humans, always think that the music by Brahms and Beethoven and Mozart is just the peak of everything? Because we all admit that on the peak of everything there is Bach anyway. But aside from that, and we, in a way, what I'm trying to say, and this has not, not so much to do with Beethoven as with Tchaikovsky, is to Tchaikovsky you come in life when you overcome, I, at least I can say that, this fear of being, of pathos. Because that's what Tchaikovsky, you pour your soul, soul in, into everything. And you don't really do that in the same way with Brahms and Beethoven. It's more, a little more controlled, a little more meticulous in terms of how he writes music. And that's why we cherish Brahms and Beethoven, maybe in a way a little more. Having said that, I just conducted a piece by Tchaikovsky that I conducted for the very first time, a symphony, which I will bring to Portland. I'm threatening all of you. And you hear me saying it, and when you see it in the program and you think, what, he wrote a symphony called Manfred, that one, it's a great piece of music. So I love Tchaikovsky. So I, I always think that when you love somebody so much, you occasionally can say something that is not like this way. <laughs> well, thank you for your forthrightness about that. The thing is, uh, I mean, just talking about the three concertos, the Beethoven concerto, very unusual piece. Because, first of all, um, scholars have discovered that this is the piece where the soloist comes out and bows to you and maybe tunes his instrument, her instrument or not, doesn't matter. And then it's the longest wait in history until Karen can play. Because she stands there and stands there and stands there and we keep on playing. But it's, it's worth the wait. And the, the fascination of this is that during the time that this violin concerto was written, Beethoven, first of all, was having, I wouldn't dare to say a great time, but he was writing a gazillion of pieces at the same time. His productivity was unbelievable. And then he comes across, to sub he just surprises his audience with this uh, piano concerto where <laughs> <laughs> the pianist comes out, bows to the audience, and instead of sitting there and waiting, starts playing, which at that time was unusual. Beethoven Piano Concerto Number 4. Um, and then he writes this violin concerto, wi with which he, in a way, uh, you can argue that he struggled a little bit, although I don't think he struggled with it. He just wanted to write this particular concerto, and he wanted... 
uh, just because he understood the instrument that way, he wanted to make it unusual. So what is so unusual about this concert? concert? First of all, the, the introduction is very, very long. And second, the role of the violin, mainly in the first movement, is um, <laughs> he switches back and forth be between being a complement to the orchestra and being the real soloist. And that is very unusual. Usually, concerts work like this. The, the soloist starts playing, everybody else shuts up, and uh, the, the soloist displays a great uh, deal of virtuosity, and uh, double stops, and flying bows, and uh, what have you. And in this concert, none of that is happening. It's a very lyrical piece. Maybe in the last movement there is a little more uh, gutsy music, but that's it. And the specifically, the, the, the soloist has sometimes to play underneath the orchestra and just playing figurines that have just the meaning of a compliment. Uh, so that is very, very unusual. And of course, um, when you look at violin concertos and Robert named two of the greatest, aside from the Beethoven, you always have this virtuosity. And this piece has no virtuosity. There is no, there are rare double stops, practically none. There is no passage that is so insanely fast that you think like, wow. Nonetheless, it's probably the most difficult violin concerto there is. Because it is so, <laughs> it's one of those pieces where we musicians will look at the soloist and when the soloist even dares to mess up, not in terms of playing a wrong note, but playing maybe a, a wrong phrasing, we already like, eh, no. And in, in, in Tchaikovsky, you can, the margin of errors is way larger. And in this one, it's either you hit it, like Karen Gomio, she hits it. Uh, or you miss it completely, and that is really difficult to do. Tell us about Karen Gomio. I know you've worked with her before. A delight. She, uh, young, uh, there is something Japanese, half Japanese, but uh, she's American. No, wait a second, she'll shoot me. She grew up in Toronto. I want to say she's Canadian. Oh boy, yeah. Yeah, she's Canadian-Japanese. And I've worked with her, actually the first time I worked with her, she was, I think, 18 years old. Um, she's now slightly over 18. Um, and she is a fantastic player, and you are going to have in front of you a very clean, incredibly clear and tasteful Beethoven which in the case of this concerto is, that's the way to go. Because if you don't have taste, go to something else. Don't, don't even touch Mr. Beethoven. Don't go even close to Mr. Mozart. Play all this fast and furious. That's fine. So she's great. And since the concerto is the first half of the concert, Karen Gomio will be signing CDs at the Classical Millennium table in the lobby during intermission. So, and you can pick up other recordings there, including uh, one or two conducted by Maestro Carlos Calma. Mm -hmm. After intermission, this little piece uh, written by Aaron Copeland called Letter from Home, written during the Second World War, as was the fanfare for the common man, but this is sort of the opposite side of, of the coin. It's not brassy and dramatic, it's just very sweet. I mean, you can imagine what it would be like if, if you were a soldier overseas, away from your family, and you receive a letter from home. And I imagine a kind of Norman Rockwell-esque image mm -hmm. when I hear this piece by Copeland. Why did you choose this? I choose this piece because it fits very well into the program. Uh, the program is in two halves because the Beethoven is a half by itself and it's kind of self-explanatory in the second half. The Nielsen Symphony, which is a great piece of music, uh, has a lot to do with World War I. So we thought 
if you look at the symphony by Nielsen, which is incredibly dramatic, and uh, there is real battlefields in it, there is a lot of struggle in it, then I thought that if we find a piece of music that relates to war per se, and just shows you the other side of the coin, as you, as you very accurately described it, you go and find Mr. Copeland and his letter from home, which is, mm, it's not one of his important pieces, but it's Copeland, it's the way Copeland is just a genius. He writes, and it's very simple and harmonically, mostly very pleasant, and it is the essential in his own in its own way, the essential Americana, at least the way I think it is. Always when I, uh, when I am uh, allowed to conduct a piece by Copland, uh, I think, yeah, this is how America actually sounds. You always hear the, this, in Copland, uh, you, you can hear this pastoral lyricism, and I always can, in a way, picture the wideness of the country, because this is, a very, very big country. And uh, when, I, when you come from Europe, like I do, and you just, uh, you, you just hop on an airplane, and in two and a half hours, or no, three hours, you are uh, in Lisbon, and you can't go any further because there is water after that. And then here, I mean, it's, it's incredible. One day I will do one of these things that uh, probably you all did, which is called road trip where you drive cross country and you like the Rockies and then you go into where it's flat and it's flat forever. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's, where, that's what I feel in Copeland. It's brilliantly flat sometimes. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm curious to know, since you did grow up in South America and then in Europe and, and you heard some American music before you came here, did your sense of America, with respect to its music, change once you came here, or did it stay the same? Oh, boy, it changed. Uh, I mean, I, I was just a very normal, average conductor when I came to this country, uh, who knew nothing about American music, nothing. Aside from, ah, yeah, there is West Side Story. And the adagio for strings, and it ends right there. And even, I know that when I say the, the, the essence of Americana is Aaron Copland, well, then you go and find other composers who are very, in their own way of writing, very, very American, which shows, at least in my personal view, how incredibly rich this country is. Uh, and you look, you even look at today's composer in America and you have the, um, the people who write kind of in the populistic side, you have the people who write in the very modern, and anything in between. So it's not so clear. This is a country, and their artists is just too big to be only one-dimensionally. Either you are one of those intellectual uh, composers who write with their brain. No, here you can do everything, and I think that's one of the forties of, of what you can hear in, in this country. And, well, we have a Copland. It's a tiny Copland, but it's a good piece. And then this big symphony, the Symphony Number no. 4 by Carl Nielsen, the Danish composer, which he called the inextinguishable. So he's talking about the, the human spirit, uh, which will prevail, which will go on uh, no matter what obstacles it faces, and, and let's face it, most of those obstacles are created by humans, including war. You know, it's First World War, he's writing this thing, the war to end all wars, the war to end all wars that did not end all wars by any means. Uh, and war, love, hate, all these things are expressed by artists. The, the interesting point, I think, of this symphony, if you compare, there are several pieces who relate to the idea of war. Actually, although it has been debated after this concert, we are doing a big party, the Oregon Symphony, to release our very first CD 
uh, where the orchestra recorded with me. And there is kind of this war theme over all. And then you look at the music by Shostakovich. And always the idea of war ends in tragedy, in music. There always. are no winners. There are no winners. But there is an exception, and that's this symphony. Because this symphony actually is very positive. Uh, there is tremendous struggle, there is a battle. Uh, there is, in the last movement, there will be a real battlefield, left and right of, in the back of the stage. And uh, in a way, the, you hear the drama mounting, and you think, like, this will not end well. And he manages. And that's why, he, when he called this symphony the inextinguishable, which we musicians, of course, we say the indistinguishable, um, he didn't mean the music itself. He meant the thrust for life. Life always goes on and life is always positive, which is a reflection of the personality of Carl Nielsen, because Danish composer of a kind of unusual family. Um, he comes from, a, he's one of out of 12 children. And the, the family was, the only thing that I know that was unusual in his family is, I mean, we are talking about uh, the 19th century here, is that his parents did not marry before the first child was born although they were meant to be together. So it was kind of, really, in those days. Um, and uh, then he was a very gregarious human being. And then he met the love of his life, which was uh, a wonderful woman who was an artist herself. And of course, you have on one side a gregarious, free-spirited composer like Carl Nielsen and another um, probably very strong <laughs> personality, like his later wife was, well, things get a little fiery. And it was a marriage that did not end very well. And actually it ended exactly in the year when Carl Nielsen started to write the symphony you are going to hear. And uh, you can speculate why, why the marriage ended. I mean, it has to be said that Carl Nielsen, aside from his wife, father, two children outside of his marriage, so maybe she wasn't that happy about that. <laughs> uh, so she ended the marriage and, well, things fell apart. And still you hear this music and it's, it's bright in the character. Even though the struggle is there, the, the, the character of the music is very bright it's not what I call funny music, it's more triumphant music. And there is, I don't know whether I can quote this correctly, but in, he wrote a couple of notes, Nielsen himself, about this piece. And one thing that he wrote is about classical music. Because what he meant, and me being a musician, I think, of course, you're right, dear Carl. He said that music, classical music, is life itself, whereas all the other art forms are a depiction of life. Music is life, and therefore, music is inextinguishable. And, well, you can't say it better than Carl Nielsen, I think. I think you're going to like this concert. This chat has been videotaped, and you can check that out at the website allclassical.org, or send your friends who didn't make it here this afternoon. You can tell them about it. And thank you for coming to the pre-concert chats, the, the more the merrier. It's nice to see such a big crowd here this afternoon. Thank you, Maestro, for all you do, and welcome back to Portland. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Carlos Calmer. Robert Nafright.